Well, hey, everybody. Happy Sunday to everyone listening to the podcast all around the world. Any day, guys, that we wake up in our right minds and we can live another day is a happy day. It's here in the evening time uh, on my uh, end of the globe. Um, And I'm sure that by now, all of you like me and my family and friends, you've heard, read and seen the news that Joe Biden has announced that he is stepping aside in regards to running for president again. He is uh, ditching his campaign and he is now endorsing his vice president for president, Kamala Harris. Um, Right now, at the time of this recording, we do not know who she will choose as her VP pick. If you'll stick with me near the end of the podcast, I will tell you who I like to see um, as her vice president, uh, uh, vice presidential pick. Um, But for now, I will just say at the top that Kamala Harris not only has my support and my vote, but she also has my prayers. Now, George Clooney did this, y'all. George Clooney is why this happened. This, this Joe deciding to drop out of the presidential race is because of George Clooney. And I'm going to explain that via a timeline. I don't say this to say that George was wrong. I don't believe George Clooney was wrong. I'm just stating the facts. You know, a lot of you know that I was an investigative interviewer for eight years. And one of the things that we were trained to do is that sometimes a basic timeline will answer a multitude of questions. So I'm going to go through a timeline. I'm going to prove to you guys that this was a result of no one other than George Clooney. George Clooney laid out the plans very clearly And the top Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, Adam Schiff, they all fell in line because he flexed. He didn't brazenly flex, but he humbly flexed and reminded them all, I am the money guy. And all of us know when it comes to politics, money rules, money talks. So here's the timeline. All of us, or I should say the majority of us, um, we saw the debate which aired Thursday, June 27th, live, first debate between Donald and Joe. And if you're like me, you know, your heart kind of melted a little bit. A lot of you heard me uh, share that, you know, as we were watching that I almost cried because I, I, it really hurt me, guys. And just even think about it now, I kind of feel, you know, some way. But then, too, I'm the same person. I get secondhand embarrassment from other people's embarrassment, you know. But it just hurt me to see him struggle so Um, I've been around, as most of you know, a lot of older people in my life. And so to see someone that, you know, struggled literally to not remember what they were saying, to to not be able to even seemingly know where they are, that really hurts. It doesn't matter for me if it was Joe standing up there or Josina or whomever. I I just feel that it just was it just was hard to, to watch. It was very painful in a lot of ways. Okay, but that was Thursday. Okay. Well, listen, the next day there was this one lone Democrat who, listen, I'm going to say it this way just to keep it short and sweet, who really is not influential with his colleagues and really doesn't have any quote unquote power. Right. He came out and he was like, he needs to step down, blah, blah, blah. And he was ransacked literally almost, uh, I should say figuratively by his fellow Democrats, the ones who do hold power and not just power, but influence over their fellow Congress people, right? Basically shut your mouth in so many ways, right? But we, we saw from all the major ranking Democrats solidarity with, with Biden, Yes, he had a bad night. He had a cold. A lot of you know Donna Brazile is a consultant, right? She was like, I'm sticking with Biden. There was a lot of influential people, not just inside the party, but who consult and straddle around the party. They were all Biden, Biden, Biden. A few days later, July 5th, which was Friday, two things happened. Friday morning, the president was in Wisconsin. He was defiant. He was strong. He was he was he was solid. He was revving up the crowd. He was a totally different man than we'd seen on the stage live just a few days later, earlier. And he was saying to the crowd, they're trying to push me out. I'm staying in. They were like, go, Joe. Remember, we played that clip. You've seen it on your own as well. That was Friday. Well, then later that night, Friday night, July 5th, is when what some people call the disastrous interview with George Stephanopoulos on ABC aired, where, again, the president made a few gaffes. 
seemingly, you know, got lost a few times and so on and so forth. But still, after that, the top ranking Democrats were still standing in solidarity with the Biden-Harris ticket. Just a few days later, July 8th, Joe is still out here giving interviews. He's traveling, he's on the campaign trail. He's even more defined. He's saying no. And he even said, I dare any other Democrat who feels I'm not fit and I'm not the best person to beat Donald Trump, challenge me. Challenge me at the convention. Everybody was silent. But then, but then, girl, July 10th, on Wednesday, when the New York Times published George Clooney's op-ed, The World Changed. I'm going to read it to you because I'm not sure how many of you read it. And if you did read it, I'm not sure if you remember exactly some of the things he said. He called people out of darkness into light in that, in that op-ed. He forced their hand. And he also, as I said earlier, he flexed and he reminded them, don't play with me, in essence. Every single thing he laid out for them to do in that article, they are now doing. I'll read it to you in just a second. So that was July 10th. The article comes out Wednesday. The very next day, Thursday, July 11th, who do we hear supposedly is now making her rounds and calling Democrats and trying to get to speak to the president, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, as most of us know, is the most powerful woman, we could say in politics, but definitely in the Democratic Party. The next day, July 12th, Chuck Schumer speaks out. Biden needs to step aside. And then after that, Hakeem Jeffries speaks out. Biden needs to step aside. It's not a coincidence that, coincidence, excuse me, that these three people speak out, the leading Democrats, because he put their names in black and white. Now, let me read the article. It's very short. I'm going to ask for your patience. I am going to read it verbatim. I'm going to give you the title so that you can Google smuggle it for yourself. It is a free article, so you don't have to have a, you know, a subscription to the New York Times. But it's titled here, I love Joe Biden, but we need a new nominee. Please listen for how he flexes. Listen for it, okay? It says here, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I make no apologies for that. I'm proud of what my party represents and what it stands for. As part of my participation in the Democratic process, and in support of my chosen candidate, I have led some of the biggest fundraisers in my party's history. Barack Obama in 2012, Hillary Clinton in 2016, Joe Biden in 2020. Last month, I co-hosted the single largest fundraiser supporting any Democratic candidate ever for President Biden's re-election. I say all of this only to express how much I believe in this process and how profound I think this moment is. I love Joe Biden as a senator, as a vice president, and as a president. I consider him a friend, and I believe in him, believe in his character, believe in his morals. In the last four years, he's won many of the battles he's faced. But the one battle he cannot win is the fight against time. None of us can. It's devastating to say it, but the Joe Biden I was with three weeks ago at the fundraiser was not the Joe Bi- the Joe big fucking deal Biden of 2020, excuse me, 2010. He wasn't even the Joe Biden of 2020. He was the same man we all witnessed at the debate. Was he tired? Yes. A cold? Maybe. But our party leaders need to stop telling us that 51 million people didn't see what we just saw. We're all so terrified by the prospect of a second Trump term that we've opted to ignore every warning sign. The George Stephanopoulos interview only reinforced what we saw the week before. As Democrats, we collectively hold our breath or turn down the volume whenever we see the president whom we respect, walk off Air Force One or walk back to a mic to answer an unscripted question. Is it fair to point these things out? It has to be. This is about age, nothing more. But also nothing that can be reversed. We're not going to win in November with this president. On top of that, we won't win the House and we're going to lose the Senate. 
this isn't only my opinion. This is the opinion of every senator and congress member and governor who I've spoken with in private. Every single one, irrespective of what he or she is saying publicly. We love to talk about how the Republican Party has ceded all power and all of the traits that made it so formidable with Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush to a single person who seeks to hold on to the presidency, and yet most of our members of Congress are opting to wait and see if the dam breaks. But the dam has broken. We can, we can put our heads in the sand and pray for a miracle in November, or we can speak the truth. It's disingenuous at best to argue that Democrats have already spoken with their vote and therefore the nomination is settled and done when we just receive new and upsetting information. We all think Republicans should abandon their nominee now that he's been convicted of 34 felonies. That's new and upsetting information as well. Top Democrats Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, Nancy Pelosi, and senators, representatives, and other candidates who face losing in November need to ask this president to voluntarily step aside. All of the scary stories that we're being told about what would happen next are simply not true. In all likelihood, the money in the Biden-Harris coffers could go to help elect the presidential ticket and other Democrats. The new nominee wouldn't be left off ballots in Ohio. We Democrats have a very exciting bench. We don't anoint leaders or fall sway to a cult of personality. We vote for a president. We can easily foresee a group of several strong Democrats stepping forward to stand stand and tell us why they're best qualified to lead this country and take on some of the deeply concerning trends we're seeing from the revenge tour that Donald Trump calls a presidential campaign. Let's hear from Wes Moore and Kamala Harris and Gretchen Whitmer and Gavin Newsom and Andy Brashear and J.B. Pritzker and others. Let's agree that the candidates not attack one another, but in the short time we have, focus on what will make this country soar. Then we could go into the Democratic Convention next month and figure it out. Would it be messy? Yes. Democracy is messy. But would it enliven our party? Wake up voters who, long before the June debate, had already checked out? It sure would. The short ramp to Election Day would be a benefit for us, not a danger. It would give us the the chance to showcase the future without so much opposition research and negative campaigning that comes with these ridiculously long and expensive election sessions, excuse me, seasons. This can be an exciting time for democracy as we've just seen with the 200 or so French candidates who stepped aside and put their personal ambitions on hold to save their democracy from the far right. Joe Biden is a hero. He saved democracy in 2020. We need him to do it again in 2024. And that's what changed the game, y'all. In my opinion, at least. I'm not sure what you guys think about it. I didn't hear from, I should say, the world. We didn't hear via any reputable, nonpartisan news outlet that these three top Democrats he listed off had even thought that Joe should step aside, at least not publicly. But see what he did there? He said every one of these people, you know, these top people have, excuse me, top Democrats and governors and other senators and representatives have have all told me privately these things. But he called them out. And when he called them out, they answered. The next day, as you heard me say already, Nancy started talking. Chuck, Hakeem, you know. So as I get ready to let you guys go, because we all, if you're like me and you have a job, okay, we all have to prepare for the week. If you have kids, little ones, you know that school's about to ramp back up for those of you who are not in year-round school. And so there's parent-teacher meetings, right, guys? There are sessions you got to go to. There are IDs. There's school supply shopping. There's a, a plethora of things that have to be done. But I will just say that 
again, I don't think this 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 article was negative. Uh, I don't think it was bad or anything like that. I just I just it's just a big reminder of what of what real power looks like, what real flexing looks like. And a lot of you know <clears throat> that it came out Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie was on ABC's The View on Friday this past Friday. Uh, July 19th. And he, he spilled the beans, at least for me, this was the first time I'd heard it. According to him, he was told that George Clooney consulted with Barack Obama, former president, uh, prior to writing his op-ed. And he told him what he was going to write. And he gave, gave him the, okay, the thumbs up to go, go forward with it. Um, I said this before on a podcast just a few days ago when I was talking about the assassination attempt on the former president, that one of the things I learned in being, um, you know, an investigative interviewer, you know, because people are trying to hide the truth. So you have to use so many things to get at the truth. And one of the tools that I learned very early on is watch the people who are not speaking so much. Watch the people really quiet. Watch the people who are making moves behind the scenes. And those will typically be the people who aren't saying much. Other than this uh, op-ed, George hadn't said nothing. But once he said something, uh, moves got made, right? So why did I cry? Why did I cry when I was watching the news today? Well, I cried because I didn't want it. I didn't want Joe to step aside. You say, but you, t- you just said, girl, that you saw him. I know. I, saw, I said that and I saw that. But I, you know, when I learned <clears throat> that the a neurologist had been visiting, had visited rather, the White House eight times over eight months. I understood what that meant. I I knew, I understood that they were monitoring his condition and they knew the reason the guy kept coming back is because he's probably in the early stages of Parkinson's disease. Uh, I don't know if I said this because I don't have any full flesh notes here. The neurologist was uh, specialized in Parkinson's disease. Um, And that was shown by the White House logs. For those of you who didn't know that story that came out a few days back. Of course, the president denied having any major health issues. Um, But I I understood what that meant, that he's in the early stages. They're monitoring it. He's still good. Um, It's kind of like when you get diagnosed with anything, there are stages and there are certain things, you know, you're good at this stage, maybe not going to be so good at another stage. But for me, a lot of you know that one of the experts that I hold in high esteem is Dr. Bandy X. Lee. B-A-N-D-Y, X Lee, you can find her anywhere on social media. She is a forensic psychiatrist and psychologist. She specializes in violence. She has worked with the World Health Organization. She was a professor at Yale before she was fired for speaking out and warning the public about the the psychotic dangers of President Trump and that his psychotic symptoms would spread. A lot of you remember um, her and her esteemed colleagues. um, They wrote a book, 37 psychologists and mental health professionals, um, you know, the dangerous case of Donald Trump. And I look to her as an expert. I don't, you know, for me, an expert is not somebody who just has the education, but they also have the experience. She worked in the field for 25 years and she continued. I mean, she worked with some of the most dangerous prison cell gangs, guys that are here in our country. She's been consulted by international figures because there are other countries who believe in bringing mental health professionals to the table of decision making. The U.S., unfortunately, other than our Surgeon General and a few other people, uh, we just haven't done that yet. But after that debate, I immediately went to her Substack. I follow her on social media and I want to see what is she saying. She's an expert. Again, not just in education, but in experience. And she said, I am not worried about his mental fitness to serve. And I took my cue from her and I thought, okay, she's an expert. I'm not. She's seen more than I have. I believe her. And so I wasn't concerned about his ability to lead the country. I I also believed that and still do that President Joe Biden has the ability to staff the right people around him. No person, be they fit or unfit, (laughs) in this case, nobody runs the The United States alone. The president, yes, is the final decision maker in the face of our country, our nation, but he or she doesn't act alone. They have a team of 
people that help them run the country day to day. And I know and I believe in my heart, Joe Biden has the conscience, um, the empathy, the ability to know right from wrong, which does matter, guys, to staff the right people. I mean, he's done it now in his current administration. And so I had faith and I still do have faith in his abilities. Yes, yes, yes. I believe he has Parkinson's, but I believe he's in the very, very early stages. And again, as I said, I believe that's why he's being monitored. I don't know that. I'm not a mental health professional. Dr. Bandy Exley did not say that. She just says she was not seeing all that she saw. Even after the debate, she's not concerned. I thought, okay, I'm not going to be concerned either. We have to have people, of course, in our real everyday lives that we can touch, feel, and talk to, but also real people in the world of their expertise in their area, in their field, and who we can look to to say, okay, uh, this person's not worried. I trust them. You know, she's not out to make anything. She's not, she's not a grifter like a lot of these people, right? And for me, having researched her heavily and followed her now for six years, I believe what she has to say. So I say all that, say I wouldn't worry, but I cried because I just didn't want him to step down. I thought, oh, he gave into the pressure, George. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. He gave into the money pressure. I mean, listen, this stuff costs money, y'all. These campaigns, I mean, I was like, what? Six million dollars can be gone in two days? What? You know, a lot of us, listen, I haven't had, um, you know, six million dollars. Okay, so I don't even, can't even fathom what that would even be, look like. How many zeros are we talking about here? You know, how many, you know, six billion and whatever, what, what is this, you know? So for me, you know, the concept of six million or whatever they said, dollars being gone in a day, I'm like, well, what the heck were we doing here? But then too, they talk about all the ads and here and there and then, the, the, and I'm like, okay, yeah, it does make sense. That kind of money can be gone. So you need my, folks with big pockets. And so, If the donors start talking and George is the leading donor, he's bigger than even the Disney lady who said, oh, I'm holding my coins until I know more information. Right. Um, And so at any rate. So it was just so sad. You know, it's just sad. It was sad for me to know that he stepped down. But I agree with everyone that I've seen on the news talking about it. It was a patriotic thing to do. Yes, it was a pressured decision. I don't feel that he would have had this this not happened. Um. But he did. And um, as I've said before, I believe most Americans are like me and they're like you. They're good people, y'all. And the good people in this country, folks like me and you, we can see the writing on the wall. We know what's going on. And I really hope that every single one of you listening to me plan to vote. If you're not planning to vote, get away from my page. Like, what kind of citizen are you? Can you not see what's at stake here? If you've never voted in your life, this should be the one time you do. I don't really mean get out of my page. I'm sorry. That's just my emotions. I just say that to say I'm still baffled by people who say I'm not voting. And yet these are the very people who fill up your comment section with Project 2025 and such and such. And, uh-huh, and what are you going to do about it? The things that think that you can do is vote, vote, vote these. Don't vote them in. And not voting is a vote for Trump. Not voting is a vote for Project 2025. The thing that you're so afraid of, that's a vote for that. So at the end of the day, guys, I am watching this. Um, If you're like me, your family, your friends are heavily into politics, not just locally, but also pay attention to what's happening nationally. And so this is just like, uh, you know, we're all a little bit nervous, you know, nervous in the sense that this is just like, uh, you know, but this was like the timing to do that, this, but like George said in his article, uh, there's time. It, it, to me, it doesn't seem like it's time, but the, the people who know, they're saying there's time to fix this. By the way, I want to encourage everyone to go on Bandy. Okay, after I cried and talked and all those things, uh, I did go immediately to Dr. Bandy Lee's Substack, and she was happy about the decision, and she said what she had to say, and so I encourage everyone to to go on her Substack. If you don't know about Substack, just find her, Bandy Exley, on X or or. Uh, She's on X and Instagram, and uh, she will have a link there, and you can read what her thoughts were about today's decision. And whoever else you held, you hold up as um, an expert. Now, listen, these talking head folks, they're not experts. They're just experts in inflaming people with, the, with rhetoric. 
be they the Roland Martins or the Tiffany Crosses, who I love, by the way, but I have enough sense to know Tiffany got bills to pay and she's going to be on the same narrative as she always is. Okay. Um, the other people that, you know, a lot of us talk a lot about in this community. So you got to have people, okay. Who are real experts who you can go to. Um, you know, so it's just, is this just, just a very, you know, you just feel like, wow. And why on a Sunday, isn't it just so interesting that the most important political news seems to break on a weekend and it's like, y'all, y'all playing with us. Okay. But at any rate, so it's just, it's just, it's nerve wracking because I just feel bad for Joe y'all. That's what makes me nervous. I'm not nervous about our country. I know that good people are going to win in the end, but I'm nervous because I wonder how he's feeling. You say, it don't matter how he's feeling. Think about democracy. Well, I'm sorry. I have a heart. I wonder how the man is feeling. I wonder, is he sad? You know, I wonder, I just wonder, because it was all a pressure campaign, Um, a financial one, George. I'm going to keep going back to George. But at any rate, as I end, who do I want to see as Kamala's VP? Now, I am, you know, a lot of you have heard my commentary on Kamala Harris um, before. It has not changed, okay? Um, But I do believe that she has the chops to do what it takes. I also believe she has the conscience to staff the right men and women around her. But, you know, George, did you see how George laid those names out in his uh, op-ed? Wes Moore was first, then it was Gretchen Whitmer. Um, maybe in his mind, he was just writing. Maybe, you know, on some sort of a subconscious level, he was putting forward to the Democrats, <laughs> letting them know, mm-hmm, these need to be the people, right? But at the end of the day, I'm going to support a Kamala Mickey Mouse ticket. Okay, so it don't matter to me because I am voting for my democracy. The things that are important to me, the things that really matter in terms of the issues, I put all that to to the side, to the back burner, because I understand right now we're in a very special situation. In my lifetime, we've never been here. And so I want to see my country continue to move forward. I don't want to go backwards. I don't want to Project 2025. I don't want anybody who even agrees with Project 2025 in 2025 in any position of um, authority or any position of real power in this country. And so for me, I'm thinking about what matters. Um, I don't like the race war that's been building the uh, uh, excuse me, the ones who have been trying to stir up the race war. I don't like that a woman's right to choose has been snatched from her. And I, a lot of you have been with me for years, you know my stance on abortion. But the reason I am for Roe v. Wade being the law of the land is because when you roll that back, you start rolling back the other things that are going to affect me on a personal level. And so the bottom line is that, you know, I believe that Kamala can do this. She has my my vote. She has my prayers. She has my support locally. A lot of you maybe are going to be on the ground in your local, uh, you know, headquarters or whatnot. Um, also, who do I want to see? I would love to see um, a Harris Whitmore ticket, you know, Gretchen Whitmere. Um, I also would love to see a Harris Westmore ticket. You know, when it comes to the men, because I've seen this morning on ABC, they were talking about Mark Kelly and Gavin Newsom. And what I'm about to say is pretty anecdotal. And some people would say doesn't matter. But I really think, you know, you got to take in consideration that there are some men, especially the alpha male, they have a very difficult time playing second fiddle to a woman. Now, when it comes to brute power, right, anybody who's offered that position is going to take it, alpha or beta, right? They're not going to care. They're all going to be thinking about their own political ambitions for 2028, right? But in terms of, I'm going to say this, Kamala historically has a difficult time working with her staff. That's just real talk, y'all. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, but I don't know if they've done the research. Maybe they think it's just my opinion. The lady has a difficult time keeping staff kind of communicating because she struggles to communicate sometimes clearly, although she's a prosecutor and you wouldn't think that. But, you know, listen, being in a courtroom is different from working with people day to day. OK, that, that calls for a whole different set of skills. Right. Um, so I just you know, when you're when you're VP, you got to play second fiddle. Your job is to shine, to make sure the spotlight stays on the president. Right. And to basically be a mirror to the president. And so I think it's very, it's going to be very, very important that if they, if they go with the male, that the male needs to be a beta male, like Pete Buttigieg. Okay. 
It needs to be a beta male. It needs to be a man who has no problem, okay, playing second fiddle to a woman in power, in a position of power. And you got to think about that person's spouse. You know, you can't, maybe your spouse is okay with you playing second fiddle, but you're, uh, you know, we don't want a Jenny Thomas thing. Y'all know what I mean by Clarence Thomas's wife, Jenny Thomas. You don't want a spouse like that. So even their spouses matter. And, you know, I've seen interviews with Pete Buttigieg and his husband and they, uh, his husband seems like a really nice person. Um, so, you know, he might would be good. Um, but at the end of the day, I really think that they are going to have to take those types of things into consideration because who knows what tomorrow will bring with this whole Trump mess. And so we got four years and these people, whoever they're going to be, uh, the last thing we want <laughs> is to be able to then start getting leaks from the White House that such and such is not getting along with Kamala and such and such and such and such. And there was an argument over here in the corner because some men, they have a very difficult time humbling themselves to a woman and saying, yes, Madam President, right? You say, well, these people are so desperate for power. They'll tuck their di- Oh, excuse me, excuse me. They'll tuck their penises and do whatever she says. But you know what? I don't know, y'all. Gavin and some of these other men, they uh, like Mark Kelly, they have been used to running the show and, and kind of being, you know, out there front and center. I don't know. So you guys have to drop down there in the comments. And let me know what you think about that. Okay, guys, let me let you go. We all got things to do. Thank you so much for hanging out with me this Sunday as we hang out together and talk about our feelings, our thoughts about the announcement that was made today. I want to just, uh, uh, you know, assure everyone who may be a little bit nervous. And when I say nervous, I don't mean nervous about what I was telling you, like nervous about how is Joe feeling? How is it? You you know, Um, but maybe you are truly scared um, and all those things. I can promise you everything is going to be okay. It really is. It really, really is. Things are going to work out just fine for us in this country. Why? Because me and you, we make up the majority of Americans. We are good. We are hardworking. A lot of us are God-fearing. Uh, we love our families. We love our communities. We love our country. We are real patriots, okay? Um, we know how to get along with each other. We love our neighbor, you know? Um, you know, we believe in putting back into this economy. All those things, we do our civic duty. Most Americans are like us. And so, even had... By not dropped out, Trump still would not have won. Remember, I I keep going back to this. The past predicts the future. He didn't win the popular popular vote when he was running against Hillary. Remember the out, all the protests when um, Hillary won the popular vote? And remember, he only had help to win the election because of Russian interference. That was proven by the Mueller report. Remember that? Robert Mueller, I know that was a while ago, right? Okay, and then in 2020... Right. Joe said after hearing him say there were good people on both sides, he came out of, quote unquote, quote, retirement, so to speak, some pe- people say. And, um, you know, we know he wasn't retired. But I think you understand what I mean by that. And he said, I, I, I feel compelled by God to get in this race and defeat this man because I can see where he would take our country. And that's not where we're going to go. And Joe defeated him. And in 2020, 81 million people. 81 million people. Don't focus on the 71 million that came out for Trump. Focus on the 81 million, (laughs) which is more than 71 million. 81 million people came out to vote in support of Joe Biden and democracy. And that was just with the little stuff we saw then. Now you think about all the stuff Trump has said and did since then. Once again, people are going to come out in record numbers, in particular the young people. And all of the Republicans attacking the LGBTQ plus community, all those young folks are going to come out. Attacking a woman's right to choose all women, we're going to be speaking up. Even if you yourself don't believe in abortion, you have a daughter who one may one day, unfortunately, if if you know if something were to happen and she has a she gets pregnant and it's between her life and the baby's life, I, I believe you'll be on a board uh, board for abortion then, wouldn't you? So you got to think about not just you, but those you love. They may have to make a decision at some point in their life and you want them to be able to make the choice that they need to make for their own life and well-being. So at the end of the day, guys, we got this. Yes, we do. Yes, we can. (laughs) Yes, we can. It's all going to work out. What do we already talk about? Keep your eye on the prize. 
Do your own civic duty. See, you don't want things to burn down. And then you say, and somebody turn to you and say, well, did you vote? Uh, No, I stayed at home. We just may burn you down with it. No, I'm joking. I'm just joking, guys. It's just a little jokey joke. But at the end of the day, nothing uh, is going to get off the ground. Okay. Those who are powerful, like the George Clooney's, you saw what they did. You saw what he did in just writing an op-ed. Okay. They're more like him. And they are quietly working behind the scenes. Everybody who's got an ounce of sense and a piece of humanity left in them can see what would happen under another Trump administration. Nobody wants that. Nobody of real good character and conscience wants that. Oh, they may not want Joe. They may not want Kamala, but they don't want that. And so they're going to vote for the Democratic ticket like I am. And hopefully those of you listening will. Thank you guys so much. I'll talk to you on the next podcast. Have a great week, y'all. Bye.